Oh boy, I sure do love reading your guys' supportive comments. Like this one. Next, he'll make a working computer inside Pokemon Showdown. Haha, <laughs> if I could do that, I'd be some sort of god. If... If I could do that... I'd be a god. Alright, let's put my computer science degree to use for the first time in two years. So, when we say we're making a computer, generally speaking, we mean we're creating some kind of system that can take some sort of input and compute or calculate something. This is a pretty broad definition and can take a lot of different forms, and includes things like when people make analog binary calculators with marbles or inside Pokemon Sapphire, for example. So, let's get a little more specific. We want to make a system inside a game of Pokemon Showdown that is Turing complete. I'm aware any computer science grads in the audience just had trauma responses of varying severities, but rest assured, I'm going to keep this as light as possible. No finite state automata or, or compilers here. <sighs> so, Turing completeness is really simple. It's actually comically easy to explain. A system is considered Turing complete if it can do everything a Turing machine can do. What's a Turing machine? Uh, that one's that one's hard to explain. Okay, imagine if you will a long tape of cells. Then imagine if you're if you're still with me, a head that can travel up and down the tape and can look at any one cell at a time. That head can read the contents of a cell if there's anything already there and can write and overwrite the contents of cells. The machine also decides where to move and how to operate the head based on its current state and what the head just read. The reason I'm bringing any of this up is because a Turing machine is able to, given enough time and space, run any given computer program, and therefore so can any Turing complete system. We just have to be able to implement a similar system inside a Pokemon battle. That'll be easy, right? We can break down Turing completeness into four distinct properties. Let's go through them and talk about how we can more or less replicate them inside a Pokemon battle. 1. Data storage. This one is pretty easy. We can treat each individual Pokemon on a team as a cell on our tape, and then we just have to use some sort of property of Pokemon as our value to keep track of. We could use HP, PP, maybe even just whether or not the Pokemon is burned or not. Anything could work as long as we're consistent. Two. Sequencing, basically just that we can take in instructions in a specific order and do them in that order. Pretty easy in a Pokemon battle since it's turn-based. 3. Iteration. We need to be able to run a piece of code for a very long time, or infinitely if necessary. Luckily for us, we can very easily make a battle last infinitely long using healing and PP restoration effects if necessary. Finally, 4. Conditionals. We need to be able to do multiple different things based on the current state of the machine. That can mean simple things for us in Pokemon that happen automatically, like going from 10pp to 9pp when we use a move, but also high complexity stuff that we'll, we'll, we'll get into it later. For now, let's start talking about actually putting all this information into practice. A good place to start might be looking at some of the simplest real world examples of Turing completeness that exist. Here's one of my favourites and the language we're going to be basing our showdown computer off. Brainfuck. Brainfuck is an esoteric, minimalist programming language. And all that means is that the code looks like this. And yes, it's, it, it looks like that on purpose. Programming is a deeply silly vocation and anyone telling you otherwise is earning far too much money for you to take them seriously. Okay, I promise we're nearly done the comp sci lecture. We're nearly at the point where we can just start playing Pokemon, I promise, just, just a little bit longer. Here's how Brainfuck works, and it's super similar to the Turing machine. Imagine a long line of cells, and a pointer or head starting at the first cell. When the code reads one of these arrow symbols, it moves once in the corresponding direction. If it reads a plus, it increases the number in the current cell by one. If it reads a minus, it decreases it by one. That's literally it. That's how the entire language works. The only other important thing is that the code can do loops with these square brackets. Basically, if it reaches the end of a bracket pair and the current cell the pointer is at isn't zero, the code jumps back over to the open bracket and goes again. Okay, computer science lecture is over. Let's start the real video. Just one more quick thing before we get into the Pokemon stuff. I'm hoping to try and reach 50,000 subscribers by the end of the year. 
Only about 15% of people who watch my videos are actually subscribed, but if even half of everyone watching this right now subscribed, I'd be well on my way. This would bring me about halfway to my actual lifetime goal, which is to melt down a silver play button into some sort of paperweight. I'm telling you, that's a lot of aluminium they send you. Anyway, let's get back to the video. Our goal is to implement Brainfuck inside Pokemon Showdown. We're going to interpret each symbol as a set of instructions to perform on a single turn in a battle in order to run our code. But first, we have to actually figure out how it's going to all work. I've been specifying that we're using Pokemon Showdown for this, as opposed to an in-game Pokemon battle, and that's very much on purpose. One reason, of many, is that we need more than 6 Pokemon to act as our cells, and Showdown lets us have as many as 24 in a custom game. Technically, a true Turing machine has an arbitrarily large number of cells, but we'll make do. Really, even actual computers don't have infinite space. Gr granted, they have a little bit more than 24 bytes of space, but sure look. We can basically use any Pokemon for our cells that we like, with a few exceptions, because we're going to be abusing the custom game rules that let us give any Pokemon we want any ability and any moves. So, I'm going to use Porygon for every cell, partially because it's thematically appropriate and partially because, woo, normal types, woo! For each cell, we're going to use its current HP as our value we care about and work with, starting at 1 and going up to a maximum of 256. We consider the cell that's currently out on the field as the one being pointed at by the pointer head. We also need a Pokemon out on the other side of the field, and it's going to help us a lot in our operations, so we're going to go ahead and call it our head. For this Pokemon, we're going to use a Cofagrigus, because it's the most head-themed ghost type with high defense. Don't worry, it'll become clear why these factors are important in a second. Our first order of business is to figure out how to change a cell's HP by exactly one. Unfortunately, there's no move in the game that simply restores one health every time, so we have to get a bit creative. Health ceiling moves restore half of the damage dealt rounded down, so if we can find a way to get our Porygon to deal exactly one, two, or three damage every time it attacks with a move like Horn Leech, we have our instruction for the plus symbol. Unfortunately, that's easier said than done. We could give our head the fluffy ability and make it the grass type with forest curse and we're so close to that max of 3 damage but we're still off. Not to mention a stray crit would ruin our entire calculation so we need to make sure that there's no randomness in our system either. We need to take advantage of another element of the showdown client's custom game mode, shared power. In this game mode, every Pokemon you send out has all the abilities of every other Pokemon on your team you've sent out this battle and this means we can get really silly with things. First of all, Kavagrius needs the Shell Armor ability so it can't receive any critical hits. Next, we need to increase its defense, so let's give it the Fur Coat ability to double it. With these abilities, and the Fluffy ability on top of that, we can get just under the threshold and can now only heal exactly 1 HP when using Horn Leech. Now let's do the minus symbol, the decrease by 1 instruction. We hit a slight snag here, insofar as that we need Kavagrius to be the one to deal the 1 damage here, even though Porygon used the move for the plus symbol for increasing HP. There's technically nothing wrong with the moves used to carry out instructions being split between the cells and the head Pokemon, but it, it would make my brain much happier if this wasn't the case, so we're making my life harder on purpose and fixing it. Here's how. Let's give all of our cells the Wonder Guard ability. Now they can only be hit by super effective moves. Every turn, the only move the cells use is Copycat, which simply mimics the last move used in the battle. If the next code instruction is to execute the plus symbol, Kofagrigus will use Horn Leech, which will do no damage to the Wonder Guarded cell. The cell will then use Copycat, forcing it to use Horn Leech, dealing between 1 and 3 damage and healing it by exactly 1 HP. Now, if we want to execute the instruction for the minus symbol, we need to deal exactly 1 damage to our cell using Kofagrigus, and it's going to have to be a super effective move and therefore a fighting time move. Luckily for us, we have a pretty low damage fighting time move in Mach Punch. This is great and all, but we do have the same problem as last time. How do we make sure we only deal 1 HP of our damage to our cell? This is actually even more problematic than the HP restoring question for a few reasons. Mainly, that we have to use a super effective move and we can't deal between 1 and 3 damage, it has to be exactly 1. Even with the fluffy and fur coat abilities, the damage just isn't being offset enough. So we have to do two things. First of all, there are three abilities that reduce super effective damage by 25%. We can get all three of those at once, then also decrease Kofagrius' level all the way down to 50 to guarantee the most damage taken is exactly 1. Unfortunately, this leaves us with a side effect. 
we decreased Coffergreaves' defense, which increased Hornleash's damage beyond the three damage maximum. So we're gonna give Coffergreaves the Tablets of Ruin ability as well to offset that damage. All right, now we can increase or decrease the HP of any given cell by one point at a time. Great. One small problem though, the iterative property of Churn Completeness. Yeah, that one there. Yeah, it's knocking on my door holding a crowbar. Right, we need to not only be able to increase and decrease our cell's HP, we also need to be able to do it an infinite number of times. And right now, our PP is going down and our head is slowly dying. Uh, hmm. <clears throat> our head is slowly dying one to three HP at a time. All right, let's solve that problem. So, we can ensure that our power points never run out by making every Pokemon hold a Lepa Berry. Lepa Berries restore 10 power points to a move that's ran out, but they are consumed on use. But we can give each Pokemon the Harvest ability, which gives its user a 50% chance of restoring its berry at the end of every turn, or a 100% chance in bright sunlight, and we can make sure it's always bright out by using a sunsetting ability, but Drought won't cut it since it wears off after five turns, so uh, no. We're gonna use Desolate Land, Primal Groudon signature ability, which makes bright sunlight active for as long as the user is out. Now every Pokemon will restore their berry 100% of the time at the end of every turn, so PP will never run out. Okay, now we have to figure out how to make sure Coffergrigus can't die, and, and items aren't an option since it needs a Lepa Berry. Uh, what we could do is give it the Seed Sower ability, making it so that every time it takes damage, the Grassy Terrain effect starts, which heals all grounded Pokémon by 6% every turn. As long as Head never takes more than 6% from any one attack, it will never have less than the full HP at the end of the turn. But... Okay, but now we're going to be healing the cells as well, so we need to fix that, but... But Grass Terrain only heals grounded Pokemon, so what we can do is give every cell the Levitate ability as well, so they're not grounded, so they won't be healed by the Grassy Terrain. So there we go, uh, problem solved, I guess. It's, it's pretty silly, but it works. <laughs> okay, so that's the plus and minus symbols finished, and now we've also guaranteed that our code can run forever if necessary. Next thing to work on is the left and right arrows. The corresponding moves for these are U-Turn and Flip Turn, and just like before, the head will use the move, it will fail because of Wonder Guard, and then the cell will copycat it, and... Right, yeah, flip turn won't work in Desolate Land. Please tell me there's another switch move. Tell me there's at least one more switch move. If there's not at least one more switch move in the game, I am unbelievably fucked. Oh my... Oh, thank God. <clears throat> the corresponding moves for left and right are U-Turn and Volt Switch. Unfortunately, there's no way in a battle to force a switch to a specific Pokémon. You can either force a random switch or give the player a choice. This does mean that when a switch move is used, the operator of the computer will have to manually select the appropriate Pokemon in the next cell over, which takes away some of the automation we like to see in our computers, but doesn't technically disqualify us from Turing completeness really. As part of the instruction set, we simply say that whenever U-Turn is used, switch the Pokemon immediately to the current cell's left, and when a Volt Switch is used, switch to the right. All right, now we've actually implemented our main four symbols. Other two symbols we care about, the square brackets used for loops, are technically instructions for the person or code interpreter operating the computer and not something we need to necessarily implement inside our battle. Now, for the 12 computer scientists watching this who actually know enough about this to get upset at this notion, can, can, we, can we sidebar it for a second? Okay, say it with me. Say it with me. A user is a valid element of a Turing machine. Right? Okay, last thing before we can actually run a program, we need to set everything up. That means switching between Pokemon to make sure all abilities are active and making sure every cell is at exactly one HP. We do this by setting up a no guard Deoxys with plus six special attack, firing off focus blasts into each cell. Another thing I'd like to ensure is that while the code is running, is that each Pokemon is unable to swap out and is forced to follow the code as closely as possible. In the case of the cells, we can prevent swaps by giving Head Shadow Tag. We can prevent Head from switching out by ensuring each other Pokemon on its team is fainted, so after each ally is sent out to activate its ability, it immediately uses Healing Wish to KO itself. The only exceptions to this are Deoxys, who Healing Wishes after bringing each cell down to one, and Gothitelle. Gothitelle is the last Pokemon in our lineup before we switch back to our Head, and we can't use Healing Wish for two reasons. The first being that it would immediately cause the current cell to copycat it and also kill itself. The second is that we need to make Coffergrigus the grass type. To do this, first of all, Gothitelle uses Agility, which the cell copies. Gothitelle's Toxic Orb then activates, giving it a six turn clock. Just before it faints, it uses Forest's Curse, which cell copies. 
after the head is sent out to replace it, the cell which is currently faster due to the agility uses Forrest's curse to give Cothagrigus the grass type. It then copies a U-turn and switches into the position zero cell, and now we're in our ready state and we're able to run any piece of code we give it. Okay, let's run some code. Here's a piece of brain for code I've written. It's designed to take two numbers and add them together, and we're gonna watch it run inside our battle. First, the plus instructions are ran, increasing the first two cells HP to five and nine. Remember, our health can't go below one here, so really we're treating one HP as being equivalent to zero in actual brainful code, and therefore the values in the cells are actually four and eight. Once we have our values set, we enter the loop. Remember, we repeat the brackets until the pointer we're looking at at the end of the loop is equal to zero. In short, what we're doing here is subtracting from cell zero and adding to cell one until cell one is empty, effectively adding the values together and placing the result in cell one. Our code is complete, so now we just check the final HP value of cell one, which is of course 13, minus one is 12, which is the answer to four plus eight. Not the most exciting program in the world, but much more complicated things could be built in theory. If you want to play around with these teams, I'll leave them in the description, so at me on Twitter if you do anything interesting with it. And that's all I have for you today. I really hope you enjoyed me trying out something a little bit different, and thank you so much if you stuck around to the end. As always, thank you so much to my patrons on Patreon, especially at least 8,700,000 ants, Chaos Lord Drago, Sean Colgan, and Zed the Man, as well as Avery Bun, Eamon Crawford, Frost Fox, Peter Claire Lomax, Squara, The Dirt Man, and Where is Spacebar, as well as everyone else you see here. Thanks again for watching, and I'll see you in the next one.